So last time I have been talking about Wikidata and I have explained why this project is a very interesting resource for all kinds of applications, especially in AI. And I have said a bit about its uh, organization and its history. But what I haven't really been talking about was the actual content of Wikidata. I've just said it's some kind of knowledge base, some kind of knowledge graphs, uh, graph. And this uh, time, it's, it's really time to uh, discuss in some more detail the actual data model of Wikidata. So this is what I'm going to do today. My name is Markus Krötsch. Uh, this uh, video is part of the uh, video series for the Knowledge Graphs lecture of TU Dresden. Um, and accordingly, I will be relatively brief regarding this data model, since it's mainly uh, here for us to understand the relationship of Wikidata and the structures adapted there to the um, other forms of knowledge graphs that we have been discussing in the course. Now, um, <clears throat> last time I have already um, told you about the um, two views that we can have on Wikidata, namely that uh, on the one hand, it is, of course, uh, a knowledge graph uh, in the sense that uh, we have a lot of interconnected entities with their relationships explicitly stated. And um, this is also how it is often used in applications. But on the other side, it is also a document centric knowledge base, a knowledge base that uh, consists of pages, documents that people view and um, modify in order to maintain the underlying graph. And both of these things are valid. And um, because of both of these uh, natures of the system, we also see some differences to um, knowledge graphs uh, in the sense of a pure RDF graph, for example. OK. So let me show you some examples. Of course, the easiest way to understand the content structure of Wikidata is just to go to any page in Wikidata and to look at what it got. Um, I here on my slides have one example that I picked uh, with uh, screenshots so to show you only the most relevant parts that I'm talking about. So this is a page on Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. And if you go to this page, you see a lot of things which I haven't, uh, which I don't show you at the moment. Um, but at the very top of the page, you can already see the label of that entity. So there's a, the name of that item we are talking about here is Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and right below that, there's a short description which says British computer scientist. This description is not a Wikipedia article. It doesn't reveal all the details that are relevant about this person. It's rather there to provide disambiguation with other entities that might have the same label. So this is a very common situation. Many things in the world are called the same. And then uh, it is very helpful to have a short expansion here, a short text, which gives you additional information in order to figure out whether this is the Tim Berners-Lee that you have um, been interested in when you are searching for something. I don't know how many interesting things uh, have the exact same name as Tim Berners-Lee, probably not that many, but for many other things, you know, that this is fairly common. Cities, for example, uh, exist in many places in different countries under the same name. Okay, so this is the disambiguation description. Um, the line below that lists a number of aliases. This is also something which is here for helping people to search for the data. So if you enter um, a search text into any of the search boxes at Wikidata or in a mobile application, uh, then these aliases will be used to find um, matching entities, even if you type something which is not their label. So this, this is their only purpose. And this is also why they are grayed out. For Tim Berners-Lee, there's quite a number of aliases here on this page. Usually, this is a shorter list. <clears throat> and finally, almost uh, if easy to overlook, uh, we have here a little a gray um, identifier, which says Q80 in Tim Berners-Lee's case. This is the actual internal identifier. Because all the things that I have here, labels, descriptions, and aliases are these texts which are specific to my language. I have viewed this page uh, with my language set to English, and these are the English settings. Um, if I would visit the same page in any other language, then I would um, see other texts on the same page. So this, uh, these labels are not unique to the uh, item. They don't identify the item, um, but they can be different in every language. Whereas this identifier here, the QID Q80, is 
uh, the actual identifier, the handle that we have for Tim Berners-Lee within Wikidata um, as a knowledge base. <clears throat> okay, so these are the this is the header, and together these different uh, texts in in a particular language are called the terms, uh, as different terms related to the item. Now below that comes the main part of the uh, knowledge base, and this is uh, the part which contains the actual statements about the subject. In Tim Berners-Lee's case, again, there are many uh, statements on the page. Let me show you a very simple one to get started. So this one here says uh, that Tim Berners-Lee is an instance of human. So he's a, uh, an element of the class human, so to speak. Um, and this is a very simple and also well, very easy to understand statement that resembles very much what we have seen in RDF. Yeah? So Tim Berners-Lee is a subject instance of would be the predicate and human the object. Yeah, so it's a, it's a small directed relationship between Tim Berners-Lee and human with the label instance of. Okay, so this looks very much like RDF and uh, directed labeled graph. So we are already in knowledge graph territory. Um, however, if you look um, further into the page, you can also see more complicated statements where this simple interpretation may not quite fit. So here you have a statement which say, states that Tim Berners-Lee's employer is CERN. But in fact, this is not his current employer, but rather it was his employer between the start time of 1984 and the end time of 1994. And the position he held there is a fellow. So we have this extra level here of auxiliary information, which is provided with that statement in order to refine its meaning and to provide context. In Wikidata, these parts here are called the qualifiers. So um, the start time, the end time, these are qualifiers that um, provide, uh, that qualify the statement regarding the, the validity time of the statement. So this is not a universal truth, but it's something that has been valid only in a certain time interval. And this is what is specified here. Um, position held also qualifies the statement in a certain sense. It uh, specifies the exact position uh, that, that uh, Tim Berners-Lee had. And uh, this is fairly intuitive to understand for humans. So it's, it's on the page, uh, it's certainly readable. Usually you can guess what is intended by such a construction, such a structure. But when we think of it in terms of a knowledge graph, we have to um, ask a, a lot of questions and you're probably all wondering now how this is fitting into the graph-like view that we normally adopt with knowledge graphs. So clearly Tim Berners-Lee is somehow connected to CERN, so there's an edge in the graph here, but where does this start time, end time and position go in this? Where Where is it in the graph? <clears throat> um, is it somehow internal to this to this employer relationship or is it also featured inside the graph? And uh, we will discuss that a bit further. For now, we will just use this as a document that people can edit. So you can, uh, if you edit the page, you can add more qualifiers to any statement, or you can change the values of the statement of the qualifier, or you can remove them. Um, so this is the document view of the um, knowledge base, and this is how people edit this and how people perceive this in the first instance, um, without asking uh, for for graph models at this point. Okay. Um, Here's one more com of these complicated statements. It says, award received Queen Elizabeth Prize for engineering. This is an award that Tim Berners-Lee got at a certain point in time. Again, we have a temporal qualifier here, but it, it's the second thing we have here is a qualifier together with, so uh, which specifies several other people who got the same award together in one um, atomic interaction, so to speak, with uh, Tim Berners-Lee. So they all got the award uh, as, as a, for a single achievement in a certain sense. And uh, see, there are several values to this qualifier, um, which are listed in their own line each, but are grouped by the, the qualifier for um, uh, simplifying the user interface mostly. So the meaning of this is not different from having together with in every line again. So it's together with Robert Kahn, it's together with Windsurf, it's together with Louis Poussin and so on. So this is um, a case where we have for the same type of relationship, several values as a qualification. Now, what we can also see for, from this statement, or at least guess at this point maybe, um, is that 
the values for the qualifiers are also items from the knowledge graph. So this is not a subordinary layer of uh, information, but it points to the very same pieces of information to the very same entities that we have also used in uh, the main part of the statement where we have the uh, directed relationship of a subject to an object. So of course, Robert Kahn and Windsurf and Louis Poussin, they all have their own item pages on Wikidata. And if you would click on any of these, you would get to these item pages. So the qualifiers refer again to the main level of the uh, graph. Um, and this is very important and it is actually, as we will see later in other videos, uh, something that distinguishes Wikidata from other graph database models, in particular from the property graph database models that some graph databases have adopted, where you have uh, a secondary level of information here, which cannot really properly link back to the main level. Um, in this case, it is also intuitive that we need this kind of connection. We don't want to have uh, Robert Kahn here as a value without tying this directly to the actual item page of Robert Kahn where we have all the other information about this person. Okay, so this is a statement and you can have many more forms of statements. Uh, if you look at any Wikidata page, you can see uh, a lot of them. And I will also say a bit more in this video. Um, there's one more thing that you can find on the page and this is uh, the site links as they are called. Um, primarily these are links to Wikipedias in various languages that uh, tell you which articles exist in different Wikipedia projects about this very same item. And these connections are used to um, connect Wikipedias across different languages. They are used to show you the in other languages uh, menu on the left of every Wikipedia article. But they are also very useful from the viewpoint of Wikidata because they uh, help us to understand and to specify what this item Tim Berners-Lee Q80 is actually about. Because on this page, we just have some data and okay, there is some details here, but at some point this was almost empty, this page, and maybe there wasn't a lot of data. And the first question one could then ask is, which Tim Berners-Lee do we actually mean by this? Yeah? And if you have links to 100, uh, or as it is here to 126, and different Wikipedia pages, which all describe in detail this person by a long human readable text. This gives you a, a, an excellent basis for um, defining the meaning of such an item. So it's somewhat uh, a form of grounding that prevents misunderstandings. It's not always that easy. Sometimes different languages have different uh, views on a topic and they do not actually describe the same thing. Um, but a related thing. So there are, of course, challenges in this modeling, but in general, it is very um, uh, informative, very useful to have uh, these connections to actual resources about the same thing. And uh, well, this is, the Wikipedia links are not the only thing here. There are other links to other projects in the Wikimedia world that uh, may also be related to this item. For example, a page on Wikimedia Commons where you can find pictures uh, of Tim Berners-Lee. Okay, so this is the data model. And um, so, as I said, as a document model, it should be fairly um, understandable from an intuitive perspective. Um, also, we can really see how it, how these pages are, of course, documents and have a very document-like um, structure and, and view to them. So if you, if you look at what I just said and it, it's the different uh, parts of the page, yeah, you see that this is really like different sections that contain different types of information. Uh, entity ID is the main thing. Then there were the terms with the different language versions of labels and descriptions and aliases. There were the statements and there were the site links. Yeah, so all of these are slightly different in how they are um, edited and how they are displayed. So it really looks like a structured document. Um, and you may ask at this point now, how will we all we will get, will we get this all into a knowledge graph? which um, does not have this kind of structure where everything is flat and unordered and also um, where the kind of uh, relationships that are expressed are usually um, very uniform. Yeah? So there's in a knowledge graph, we have the notion of an edge um, that connects different um, entities, but whether this edge expresses a site link or a statement or a term um, is, is not a structural distinction, but it, is usually just distinguished by using different labels for the 
relationships for the properties. <coughs> okay, but you can also imagine that this will be possible. I will discuss this in more detail in the next video for the case of audio. Um, one more thing is written here at the bottom of this slide, namely that uh, in addition to these item pages like the one for Tim Berners-Lee that I just showed you, um, there is also a second type of entity that is very important in Wikidata and these other properties, um, and they also have pages. So if we look back at this example here, instance of employer award received, these are all properties, and these properties are not predefined by the software, they are not um, somehow hard-coded on the server side, but they are also created by users through the website. If, if users want to create a new property, if they think there's a new kind of relationship necessary to describe knowledge in this database, then they can create a page for it, give it a name, um, define some of its properties, well, properties of properties, um, in particular, have to set, they have to set a data type, which specifies what kind of values this property will take. And um, they can specify many other things in addition. The property pages in the end have uh, a similar structure like the item pages. They do not have site links because simply put, there are no Wikipedia pages about um, properties as such. So this is not usually what is described on Wikipedia, but uh, other than this, they have everything that you have on the item page and in addition, a data type declaration. Okay. Right. So this is the, well, essential uh, parts of the data models that you have to know about now. I'm not going to uh, talk about the structures much more. Um, but I would like to say a few words about some aspects of it that might have you wondering how things actually work. So one of the obvious things that, and one of the first questions that we often get with Wikidata is, um, how about those strange IDs, this Q ID, Q80 and Q whatever, um, how does that work? Is that really a good idea? Couldn't we have something more readable? Couldn't we, for example, call Tim Berners-Lee, Tim Berners-Lee? Couldn't we use this as an ID? And um, well, if you think about it, you probably can come up with uh, a number of reasons why numeric IDs are uh, at an advantage here, why they work better in this context. Um, but I can also list you a few more maybe than what you have already thought of. Well, the first uh, obvious uh, issue with readable is of course that it is a very subjective notion. What is readable, right? We are dealing here with a database which is fully international. We have something like 400 languages which are supported and these languages use different alphabets, different writing systems. Say some of them use right to left writing, some of them use left to right writing. So what is readable here? What kind of identifiers do you think are nice for everyone? And uh, already from this point of view, you can easily see that a number is actually maybe one of the best things you can do in such a context because numbers exist in all languages and are universally understood, even if we write them um, uh, left to right, maybe. Okay, so uh, this is one aspect, internationalization. Uh, things that we find readable would be completely incomprehensible to other uh, people in other languages and would make it actually worse than a number. Um, but this is not the only reason. Another reason for having numeric IDs is that they are um, much more stable than what uh, you would have with a readable, um, human readable ID. Uh, so if I, I could say, of course, Tim Berners-Lee, as a, a British, he would be uh, called by his Latin name. Uh, this would be the readable label for this person um, because this was his official name in his native language. Okay, maybe we could settle on this. But uh, this is still not a very good idea because um, labels uh, can change. Uh, if we would say persons are known by their uh, actual names as their ID, then what happens if a person changes their name? This happens in many cases in uh, traditionally when people got married, they often changed their names, but these days you can also change your name in, in many other circumstances, depending on the country where you're in. And so suddenly the, when this happens, you would also have to change the ID. Moreover, of course, there are several people with the same name, many of them actually, um, and 
uh, this poses another problem because an ID must be unique and it, it can only uh, refer to a single entity. So if you have several people with the same ID, they have to, uh, or several people with the same name, you have to still use different IDs for them. How could you solve that? I mean, you see it on Wikipedia. This actually is a, situ a case where human readable IDs are used. So articles on Wikipedia have the headline, their, their uh, heading as the identifier. This is what you have in the URL. Um, but there uh, too, you have the problem with uh, multiple entities having the same label. And what Wikidata does, uh, Wikipedia does then is usually put something else behind the label in parentheses. Um, and this works for a, for a Wikidata-like system. This is okay. It's not very distracting. And as a headline, it, it makes sense if you have Tim Berners-Lee, parentheses, computer scientists. Uh, it's still okay for humans. It's not so nice if you have an actual database, if you really want to work with the data and you would, for example, want to browse the entities and show some uh, display with Tim Berners-Lee involved. You wouldn't want to call Tim Berners-Lee, Tim Berners-Lee computer scientist in parentheses in all places. You would like to have a nicer label because usually in the context of some application, it's clear which Tim Berners-Lee you mean, or it's clear from the data, or at least if it's not clear, it's sufficient if a user can figure out by, for example, clicking on the object to get more information. It's not necessary to put this disambiguation into the label that you display all the time. So it's a bit, it's a bit cumbersome at this point. Um, but from uh, uh, the uh, fund more fundamental point of view, the problem with renaming is much bigger. The problem with uh, having conflicting names, because there are several things that should get the same ID, but only one can get it, um, is much bigger. Because it means that um, as users decide who is to get which ID, um, they also change the ID of these of existing things. And this you see a lot in, on Wikipedia. Articles are moved to new places. Um, sometimes other articles are moved into the place that, the pre that previously has been occupied by another page. Um, for example, because it turns out that uh, there's a much more important person of the same name that you would like to have as the main um, thing that you find uh, when you look for that label. Or since there are so many different things of the same name that you put a disambiguation page there, which just gives the different meanings and points you to the right location. Whatever people do, it means that identifiers are not stable. They don't have a stable meaning, but they change over time. And this is a, a, a huge issue. This is a, a poison for any kind of data integration system. If you want to build a integrated uh, web of data where everything points to uh, locations in other databases, then uh, you have to rely on the stability of identifiers. That's it. It's very important. And Wikidata guarantees that because you can change the label as often as you like without changing the identifier. And uh, you can even delete an item. That's, of course, something which sometimes has to be done. But um, if you do that, uh, you merely uh, remove the meaning of that ID. The ID then is uh, no longer um, an identifier for, for anything, but it still will not happen that the same identifier is used again. So Wikidata will never reuse the same identifier once it got deleted. There are enough numbers that we can use, so um, it's easy enough to use new IDs. So this is the best you can do in terms of stability of any uh, identification mechanism. <clears throat> okay. Um, and yeah, finally, uh, Numeric IDs are quite short. It's actually convenient. Once you get a bit used to it, it's uh, nice to have them in such a uniform format. Um, it's making it also easier for um, interfaces to display the ID. So instead of having uh, Tim Berners-Lee computer scientists in parentheses everywhere, you would have Tim Berners-Lee and a small Q80 in parentheses, maybe to disambiguate it from other meanings of Tim Berners-Lee. So um, that can also be uh, quite nice once uh, people understand that these are the IDs used in the system. It's usually quite um, usable. Um, also, you should compare that with other databases that you may know of and uh, wonder which databases use uh, human readable identifiers, which uh, databases use numeric identifiers. And um, it should be clear that uh, numbers and uh, abstract identifiers 
are the, the vast majority of all large database projects. I mean, it's just um, what you do. It's, it's just working mostly better. There are just a few exceptions, for example, databases where you have user handles like uh, Twitter, I mean, has an identifier which is based on the username, which is a unique string that the user chooses when uh, creating an account. So this kind of, in these cases, one can really have uh, some arbitrary uh, names essentially for identifiers. But everywhere else, starting from, you know, books, uh, books have ISBN numbers um, as their identifiers. These are also numbers. Nobody would pick the title of the book as a more convenient way to refer to books. And uh, if you have worked with ISBN numbers for any purposes, uh, then you would also appreciate that uh, these are much easier to handle. They are not easy to remember, but they are easy to uh, use as identifiers. Okay, so uh, hopefully you are convinced that uh, this is overall a good idea and uh, making also our life much easier than having to, uh, you know, work with identifiers which are in some completely different um, writing system, maybe from our own. Um, but still, there's the obvious question, how to find the right identifier. So how do you get in practice the identifier that you need? And um, this is actually quite easy. Uh, there's two main methods. Um, the one is just to go to wikidata.org. There's a search bar there where you can type the name of anything you are looking for, Tim Berners-Lee, for example, and the search bar does um, offer you auto-completion and does offer you suggestions for uh, the uh, possible items that you might have looked for. And then you can easily pick one of the items from that search bar. Uh, the second uh, option, which is maybe even easier, is to go to a Wikipedia page. For example, you go to the English Wikipedia article on Tim Berners-Lee, and there on the left in the, in the uh, toolbar, you have a link called Wikidata item. And if you click on this, you will get directly to the Wikidata page. And this you can do with every Wikipedia page in every language. Well, it might not be called Wikidata item. If it's in another language, it will be translated accordingly. But uh, it will always be possible to find this from Wikipedia. Of course, this only works for things that have an entry in Wikipedia. And I have explained before that this is only a, a small part of uh, the content of Wikidata. So many of the things you will rather find on wikidata.org than uh, on Wikipedia, but it's a very good way to find things which are sufficiently popular in the language that you are using for Wikipedia to have an old, own article there. Right. Um, the uh, QIDs now are fairly uh, widely used uh, and quite a few other um, database projects have started to use Wikidata IDs to refer to Wikipedia. So even if you want to refer to an article on English Wikipedia, you're much better off referring to the QID of Wikidata because from this QID, you can always retrieve the appropriate article on English Wikipedia. But um, if the article changes, users will update the site link or it will automatically be updated uh, in the Wikimedia um, ecosystem when somebody moves the page, for example. So you will always find the correct uh, article name on English Wikipedia and also on any other Wikipedia based on the QID. Uh, so if you want to permanently link to Wikipedia, QIDs are also the way to go. Right. Um, so this is um, most of what you uh, need to know about IDs and uh, the structure of wiki data at the moment. This page here lists a few uh, basic uh, pieces of information about Wikidata statements, most of which I have already explained to you. So um, you know that they are built from Wikidata items and properties and uh, that they can also use data values like 2013. This is not a page on Wikidata. Well, I'm sure there is a page of this label, but uh, the actual year 2013, as it was used in my example, is not pointing to this page. It's pointing to a time point. <clears throat> this is similar to RDF, where we already argued that it's not a good idea to have um, abstract identifiers for uh, things like time points or numbers or other uh, typical data values that an application should uh, know how to process. A call appropriately. For example, times you would like to order uh, in a certain way. And this is uh, much easier if you know they belong to a time data type than if you would consider them as abstract identifiers and try to somehow 
order them alphabetically by their label in the English language. I mean, it wouldn't work. Okay, um, based on these constituent parts, items, properties, data values, we built directed edges. Tim Berners-Lee, employer CERN, this is a directed edge. It's very much like RDF. Um, it also is very much like RDF in that the properties are first-class objects in this world. So they are um, also their own entities and they can also appear as subjects and as objects in such directed edges. Um, but the difference to RDF, and this we have to resolve uh, still, is that these uh, directed edges can be annotated with further property value pairs, with these qualifiers. Um, and we've seen that the end time was given or together with used even several values for one kind of property. Um, uh, and also here, everything we have used, as I said, is uh, from the same global address space. Yeah? These are all entities. The properties that you use in the annotations, the values you use in the annotations are the same types of properties, values, and items that you would also use in the directed edges. So there's only one, um, one universe of uh, entities that is used everywhere. Um, I already was saying that items and properties can be subjects and values in statements, just like an RDF. And um, finally, as this last bullet point says, the uh, whole structure that you get by this is um, what we would have called a multi-graph, which is a graph that allows the same edge to appear more than once. In particular, the same directed edge can appear more than once with different annotations. And uh, why is that useful? What could this be meaningful for? Why would you want to have the same directed edge twice? Well, there are many practical examples. Here is one uh, which I show you now, not in the interface of Wikidata, but this is an interface of a, of a slightly different um, web uh, tool that we have created. This is called Squid. Um, it shows you that uh, uh, there's a very nice feature of data, of course, that you can show it in different ways. Yeah, You can take data and I can display, display it in a new user interface to serve another application, for example, um, which is much easier than with uh, Wikipedia text. A Wikipedia text is always more monolithic and has to be displayed as it is. Uh, so There's not much choice there. Okay, so this here is uh, a page about uh, Elizabeth Taylor. You can see, again, all the parts of Wikidata uh, data model that we have talked about before. Um, and what you see here is, of course, that uh, uh, Miss Taylor has been standing in many relationships to a number of items which uh, are listed here. So she has been married eight times to different people, but actually only to seven different people. So there's two people here, Richard, uh, two times here, Richard Burton has been uh, married by her and, and divorced again after a few years. So um, this is an example of a directed edge, Taylor spouse burden, that occurs multiple times here with different annotations. Uh, and this is not the only such example. Yeah, yes. For example, Grover Cleveland was president of the United States uh, in two non-consecutive intervals of time and would also be listed in such a way. And there are many, many other examples. So you need to have this ability. And what this tells us is that uh, this is also slightly different from RDF in this respect, because in RDF, even if you would somehow extend RDF to have some kind of extra annotations for a statement, you would still have a statement only once. It would not um, be possible to have the same statement several times with different annotations. This is not what the RDF data model supports. Okay, and we will see how to resolve that, how to still get everything um, uh, displayed properly in RDF. Okay, right. Um, so it's a multigraph. Um, so with this, I am almost through. What I wanted to tell you about the Wikidata data model, my last slide that I have uh, gives you a brief overview of the data types that we have in the system. Um, I already mentioned that properties have a data type. This property data type is 
fixed for the property. It cannot be changed once the property is created, um, which ensures that the data that we have in the system for one property is always consistent. There's, unlike RDF, where the same property can have values of different types, even sometimes IRI, sometimes data type literals. Um, in Wikidata, we ensure that every um, property has only values of one kind. And this makes it more usable and is also meaningful in this application. So here is a slide I promised with a quick overview of the main kinds of data types. I'm not going to discuss these in details. Essentially, um, one kind of data type which is most important uh, is, of course, the entity. So you can have um, properties that link to other items or to other properties or also to other forms of entities that I didn't discuss here. Um, they are very important to state the relationships. So Tim Berners-Lee's uh, employer is CERN. This is a relationship between several entities. You can also have quantities. So everything that comes with a number, whether there is a unit of measurement or not, um, it could be a population number, could be the length of a river, could be the um, atomic weight of some kind of element. So all of these things are quantities and there's one data type which captures all of this. Um, points in time, years, years with months, years with months and days, even times of the day. Um, so points in time at different levels of precision are all covered in one data type. Um, geographic coordinates. So this is something RDF didn't really support in its uh, standard documents. Um, in Wikidata, obviously, we need that. Um, there is even a slightly more general type here, which supports uh, coordinates on other astronomic bodies. So you can state that a coordinate is on Mars. And uh, this is also done and used in practice uh, already on Wikipedia. You can find coordinates which refer to other astronomic bodies. Okay, and there's also support for shapes. So if you want to denote areas on a um, globe, then it's not enough to just give one coordinate, but you just have, so you have to specify some kind of polygon on the surface. URLs, if you want to link to external pages, and these can also be IRIs uh, if you want to connect to data sets which are in RDF or OWL or using other W3C uh, standards that refer to things with IRIs. Strings are supported, of course, there's many uses for strings and um, there are a number of special data types in Wikidata that um, create internally strings as in the end, but lead to very different user interfaces. So for example, there is a possibility to refer to a media file name on the media repository on the image database of Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons. And essentially what is stored is just a string file name. But of course, the interface that you would like to have in order to pick such a file from the media database is different from the interface that you would have for entering an arbitrary string. Now, for one thing, there should be auto-completion to find available files and help you to type the right name. Also, once you have picked that, it's, you want to see some kind of preview that shows you what the image actually contains. Okay, and there are other forms of strings which internally are strings but have some kind of special uh, uh, support through the user interface. And uh, finally, we also have texts in a specific language. This is similar to the language tag RDF strings where you have a string which contains words or sentences in a language and uh, you specify in addition what language this text is in. And this is also useful if you want to store certain texts. Now, Wikidata is not meant to store longer texts. Um, it should not have uh, Wikipedia articles in data values. That would not be um, is a proper use, but there are still many short texts that make sense and that, you, that are really text in a language and not just strings of uh, characters in an abstract sense. Um, for one example, um, many entities, organizations, countries, uh, or uh, universities, yes, have mottos. And so if you have a certain motto, it says it's usually a short catchphrase that uh, you, you specify in some language. Yeah? Okay, and this is not just a plain string. Okay, right. So all of these things exist and they can be assigned and used. And sometimes new data types are introduced to serve uh, needs that have not been um, properly addressed so far. But I think uh, right now this is fairly stable. And uh, I don't think there are major things missing for describing most things in the world. <laughs> okay, right. 
Um, so this is all for the data model. There's one thing that I have left out completely. This is references. Um, you have seen it on some of the um, screenshots that I had. Uh, every statement can also specify a source or a supporting reference, which uh, gives us information about where this information comes from. And this is um, very important in order to uh, support the claims of Wikidata, because Wikidata is not a primary uh, knowledge repository, not a primary database. It should not have uh, first-hand knowledge. It should always have second or third-hand knowledge, so to speak. It's just a collection of things that are known and established. And uh, to prove that they are really known and established, of course, we need to have references which confirm that this is really true. And so for every statement, you can state references. This is again encoded with properties and values but it will not uh, concern us uh, very much in this particular course. So I'm not going to talk about the details here. Um, right, um, so that's it. That's, a, that's the a data model. Um, if you want to learn more about it, um, there's a lot of documentation, of course, on Wikidata itself, tailored towards editors. You can go to Wikidata, pick uh, an item of your choice, maybe your birthplace or anything else where you have a personal connection and look what is stated there. Maybe you can add some properties um, to make the information more useful, more specific. And while doing so, you will also see how everything works. Okay. What I'm going to do next is to show you how all of this is represented as an actual graph. So far, this is, as I said, very document centric and we still need to figure out how to um, make this into a, a knowledge graph, in particular an RDF graph. So that's all for today. Thank you for watching and see you soon.